So this is a lesson on Giuliani's 120 arpeggios, or right hand exercises, from his Opus 1. Um, learn from the video for free, but if you feel like picking up my technique book, um, there's a link for that underneath the video, and it has 122 pages and lots of other exercises. I'll be referring to it a little bit. So this video is mainly going to cover how to practice the arpeggios. I'm not going to go through each one. What I'll do is I'll go through a couple of ways about how to practice arpeggios, and then um, I'll go over just a couple of examples and some of the stranger ones and whatnot, and just talk about them a little bit, and then you can go about practicing all 120 of them. These Giuliani arpeggios are a really great study for the right hand, and just building up dexterity in the right hand, as well as along with the chord changes. Um, and it's a real full study of classical era classical guitar playing and the kinds of things that they would do. And it's pretty comprehensive, even compared to modern standards. Um, it's the same two chords over and over, which is a little bit, you know, boring if you do all 120 of them. But just going through each one and discovering where your weaknesses lie and what you find difficult is a great um, way to discover how to improve your right hand technique. And also just as a cool study of classical era a technique for the guitar. So in my book, before the Giuliani 120 exercises, there's 100 open string exercises, which just go over various patterns. So I'd recommend that you go over some kind of open string right hand exercises before you attempt the, the Giuliani exercises. They're a little bit harder and some of them are a little bit odd. And of course you have to deal with the left hand chord changes. It's the same two chords the whole time, C and G or G7. Um, but nevertheless, going over right hand exercises alone is a great idea. And don't forget as well that anytime you want, you can take any of these Giuliani exercises and play them on open strings. And I'll demonstrate that in a second. So, um, how to practice these arpeggios. Because um, you could just play through them, all 120, and just practice them and just go through them over and over. And that will help you to some extent, but that's not really a way of practicing. That's just playing them, right? And that'll make you improve a little bit but um, practicing them in specific ways will help you improve a lot faster. So the first thing that you can do is play the, all of the arpeggios solid and broken. Actually, the first two arpeggios kind of cover that. The first arpeggio is solid chords. two takes those same chords but breaks them and plays them broken as arpeggios. But you can do that with every single arpeggio example. Whenever you have the, an arpeggio pattern, you can just play all those notes as a solid chord. That's really good practice because it teaches your left hand the shape of the chords that will, you'll need to play. And it teaches the right hand a good solid um, idea of what the distance between the strings are. And it's also kind of like practicing a full plant in the right hand, which we'll talk about as well. So you can always play your arpeggios solid and then broken just to solidify them and to solidify the pattern. Um, another way you can practice um, is just up to the downbeat. If you, a common problem for students is that they don't, they're not able to switch chords very well. Instead, when they switch chords, they slow down because their fingers are having a tr trouble kind of like getting into the new shape. Um, one thing I'd recommend for that is just practice up to the next downbeat. I'll demonstrate on number two. You can just get that one finger, the bass note of the next bar, then you'll have a split second to get the rest of the notes afterwards. So although you should practice doing the full shape, so switching all three fingers at the same time, like that, you should also just practice getting one at a time, because realistically, if you're going fast, Um, then you're going to have to just get one finger at a time and then each proceeding note one after the other. So practicing up to the downbeat is a great idea. And then if you want to add on another note, you can. 
and then the, the full next chord. Just to make sure you've reached each one very confidently. And of course you can apply this to your repertoire, right? Like anytime you're playing a piece, you can always practice chord changes in this way. So the next thing is, you. I've talked about this in another video and I made a dedicated video about right hand planting then the three types of right hand planting. Now there's a link for that video underneath um, this video so you can check that out because it's a quite a long video so it's a big topic so I'm not going to explain it fully here but just remember the three ways that we practice arpeggios are full plants that's when all the fingers are down on the strings and then they play so full plant, full plant, full plant, full plant, in time of course. But like all the fingers plant one at one after the other, or I mean, sorry, all together. Um, second way is partial plants. Then on partial plants, we'll plant the thumb, sorry, thumb, and then the next two notes. So thumb note, then I am plant, they play, thumb plants, and it plays, and then the I and M go down again. See how it's like thumb planted? And as soon as the thumb plays, I and M plant, they play, and then the thumb plants, and then the I and M plants. So it's, it's not quite a full plant, it's very close though. And then the final way is sequential planting. And sequential planting is the most legato because you're not stopping the sound of any of the notes because it's one finger plants after the other. So thumb plays, I plants, I plays, M plants, M plays, thumb plants. And it's just a continuous cycle. Each, the next finger is always planted before it plays. See how my finger is resting on the string for a split second before it actually plays. So that teaches it to be in place really early and so for speed and accuracy because if it's in the right place it'll play the right note and it'll be ready to play. So sequential planting is probably one of the best ways but nevertheless all three are very important. So watch that other video if you're confused about that but just make sure you apply um, planting to all of these arpeggios and I'll demonstrate on on one of the two-part extra um, two-part arpeggios as well about how you would plant for that. Of course use a metronome. Um, there's no substitute to using a metronome and um, you can use the metronome on various different beats but I would use it on the quarter note beat, right? So if it's this one, da, 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 if it's number two, da, 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 it's in triplets, Um, what I do with these is I'll often write down the metronome speed that I can play it well right next to the arpeggio and then every time I, I'm able to do that confidently I cross that off and write the next metronome marking. So I might start at like 80 and I write down 80. Once I can play it smoothly and legato and very confidently cross off 80 and then write 84 and then once I can do that I cross that and it's kind of like a little record of success and just make sure that it, it makes sure that I'm improving and getting faster at these without compromising on quality. So it could take months to get faster sometimes, but it's just a, it's a real indication of like, oh, I've improved a little bit and that can make you feel very positive. So that's a very um, good thing to do. And of course, using a metronome is rhythmically um, a smart idea because you'll learn to play in time very well with all these different patterns. The last thing is rest stroke in the thumb. Um, so on exercise number two, you can see I'll do a rest stroke with the thumb and then free stroke with the fingers. And of course when you play the third string, you have to get out of the way pretty quick so that the fingers can play, but you can still do it. Um, using rest strokes in the thumb, you might find that difficult at first, but it's a smart thing to do because it'll teach you a real security in the right hand. Keeps that movement very small, and then 
then you just follow it with the, fing the free stroke fingers. Um, but like I said, um, if, if you have difficulty with this stuff, you should do my 100 open string exercises so you don't have to worry about the left hand. You can just focus in on the right hand. Speaking of which, you can turn all of these into open string exercises. You just take away the chord and do the right hand pattern on the correct strings. So that's number two, just with open strings. I originally was going to make all of these open strings just for extra practice, but um, I had other patterns I wanted to cover as well, so I did the open string exercises. So let's go over a couple of the oddity um, ones. Not really oddities actually, but just ones that I, I decided I'll talk a little bit extra about. So let's go to number 11. So number 11 is um, suddenly we have two part arpeggios. When you have two part arpeggios, you can practice it in all the same ways, solid chords. Um, your planting, we just be in groups, right? So P and I on number 11 would plant, if we're doing sequential planting, P and I would plant together, and then M would plant, and then A would plant, and then P and I would plant, and then M would plant, then A. Then P and I. So it just means that you're planting different uh, groups of notes. Instead of one finger individually, you'd be planting two, and then one, and then one, and then two, so on and so on. Arpeggio number 17, this is a continuous P-I pattern, so we, we only use P and I. Um, just make sure that you, you're not feeling it in duple time, but you're feeling triplets, groups of three. So um, you don't want to feel it like this. Because that's not how it's written. It's written in triplets. So you should practice um, making it sound like triplets. If I count, one, two, three, four. It's kind of weird because you're using groups of two, but playing groups of three. So the overwhelming urge is to accent the thumb, but you don't want to do that. You actually want to accent the, the beat. So it'll be thumb accent, then eye accent, then thumb accent, then eye accent. Um, so just be careful of that in number 17 that you actually feel the triplets despite the fingering. Number 37, um, not much to talk about here, um, but Giuliani fingered it with I M, even though there's a spance between those strings. So practice that for sure. But also, you might want to practice it with a more modern fingering of using the A finger instead. It's just more ergonomic, but it's good practice to to for to expand those two fingers across those strings. So practice it both ways, even though in a, in a performance piece like in a piece. I would use the A finger. On number 37, you should also practice as written with the M. Number 89. So on number 89, um, we're going to be sweeping our thumb across two strings. So you see that double th thumb stroke at the beginning there. That, just do a light rest stroke. It's kind of like strumming a chord, but it's just a little bit smaller than that. So light rest stroke. And it'll just be a double thumb. I've also put an alternative fingering in there without the sweeping thumb, but just make sure you do in fact um, practice that sweeping thumb. Just make sure you don't go do them as separate strokes. They're not separate. They're a they should be swept through the strings. It's kind of like sweep picking um, for 
you people who use picks. <laughs> So you can practice that. Speaking of sweet picking with the thumb, um, on number 91, we're gonna actually do that both with the thumb and with the eye finger, which is a real oddity. Um, do you see how I did a sweep with the eye finger? So we swept forward with the thumb. Do a little light rest stroke and sweep through. Um, it kind of helps you to avoid awkward string crossings. You could easily play it with I, M, A with an awkward M on the top note, which is easy enough. But there are times in repertoire we have to where we have to sweep our thumb over more than two strings even. So it's a good thing to practice, and um, the eye finger on the way down is equally helpful sometimes. So a light rest stroke with the eye finger over two strings. The final string being a free stroke. That way you can continue playing onward. Bit of an oddity number 91, but um, practice it because it's a good skill to have. Number 112, it's a little bit debated um, by editors. Some editors write these write the second bar um, differently than others. So in the second bar, the original kind of clearly shows a dotted eighth note followed by a sixteenth note. But the confusion comes because Giuliani spaced it with the, with the bass note, so they look it looks like the the final upper voice is right over top of the bass. So some editors write it out the second bar of, nine, of 112. They write it out as all just triplets. But that's not necessarily what the original says. Um, so I've kept the, the original as a dotted figure over top of a triplet, which is a little bit weird. So just kind of keeping those, those rhythms separate. But like I said, um, you can go either way with that rhythm. I've decided to write it out closer to what the original does indicate. Number 113 um, includes a bit of a bar. There's not much to talk about here, actually. I've marked it in the score. So a little, a full bar across the first fret. And then you're probably going to have to get rid of it, so I let go of it and keep it as a hinge bar so that the top notes ring, but that I can play that open D string. Um, I don't see many ways around it unless you were to do something really funky. So just do the bar, release the bottom part so the D can be played, and then you're home free after that. So there's a ton of different arpeggio patterns. Um, well, there's 120 of them, right? So, and you can practice them in the five or six ways that I described at the beginning, but um, they offer a real variety and a real study of classical era, classical guitar fingering and arpeggios. So um, it kind of keeps you really informed and also works on various patterns so you can discover weaknesses in your technique and then improve them, of course. So I hope you enjoy all 120 Giuliani art exercises for the right hand.